Welcome to Penn State Dickinson Law's Profiles and Leadership Series. My name is Daryl Lim. I serve as the H. Lady Montag Jr. Chair and Associate Dean for Research and Innovation at the Law School. This series offers an unparalleled opportunity to glean insights from top leaders who serve in government, education, the private sector, and civil society. In each episode, we invite these leaders to reflect on their journeys, uh, share skills, core values, and qualities that make them the leaders they are today. We're very pleased to have Deputy Chief Administrative Patent Judge Jackie Bonilla. Judge Bonilla serves as the Senior Legal Advisor to the Under Secretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. As a Senior Legal Advisor, she counsels the Director of the U.S. PTO on a wide range of patent-related legal and policy issues, including those relevant to the America Invents Act, Proceedings and the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, or PTAP, the process for director review of PTAP decisions, litigation before the Federal Circuit and Supreme Court, and PTAP and patent related precedent, director guidance, and rulemaking. Since her appointment as an administrative patent judge in January 2012, Judge Bonilla has conducted numerous post grant patent trials under the AIA, heard appeals from adverse examiner decisions in patent applications and re-examination proceedings and rendered uh, decisions in interferences. She has served in several leadership positions at the PTAP, including as Deputy Chief Administrative Patent Judge since March 2019, helping to shape agency policy as it relates to PTAP practice and lead the PTAP as it handles cases and renders decisions in all areas of its jurisdiction. Prior to joining the USPTO, Judge Bonilla worked for 12 years in private practice, including as a partner at Foley and Lardner. She also served as a judicial law clerk to now retired Chief Judge Randall Rader at the US Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Judge Bonilla graduated from the University of Virginia School of Law and holds a doctorate in pharmacology from the University of Virginia, and a bachelor's degree in biochemistry from the University of California, Berkeley. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. This is this is a terrific event. Thank you. Well, since your the PTAP is so central to what you do and what we'll be talking about, and to the rest of the world, it may be a black box. Why don't we start there and tell us about the PTAP? That's great. I thought, especially as background for anything else we might talk about, it would be great to talk about PTAP. And I, I just thought I would do something somewhat high level, talk about, you know, what is the what is the PTAB or the board generally, you know, who we are and what do we do? Um, and so, you know, first question, what is the PTAB? Um, it's a neutral administrative body, adjudicatory body within the USPTO itself. Um, and PTAB, which is the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, we call it PTAB or the board for short, um, in that name, it was created on September 16, 2012 by the American Events Act. But it's important to know that the, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board has actually been around for a pretty long time called different things. Uh, for example, it was previously called the Board of Patent Appeals and Interferences. Um, and prior to that, it was called different things over the years. It's actually been, a, it has a long history. It goes all the way back to at least the 1860s. So um, sometimes people talk about how PTAB just came up. It's like actually the board in some capacity has been around for a long time. Um, and who are we? Well, today we're about 230 administrative patent judges. Uh, we're in five different offices uh, at the USPTO nationwide, although we do have a pretty uh, big contingency that teleworks completely, meaning they work from their home office and they don't go into an office at the USPTO. All of the APJs at PTAB are legally and technically trained. Uh, they have extensive experience in patent law and they come from places like law firms, in-house counsel, uh, DOJ, uh, the USPTO itself, such as the solicitor's office and the ITC and places like that. Um, and in addition to the, the, the sort of regular APJs that you know about, the board by statute also has four statutory members. This includes the director of the PTO, the deputy director, the commissioner for patents, and the commissioner for trademarks. So what does PTAB do exactly? I think a lot of the you know, the AIA work um, gets a lot of attention, but we do we do more than that. 
Um, for example, a, sort of our bread and butter of what we do is review examiner's work products. So um, if somebody has a, uh, has gone through prosecution and they've received a second or final office action from an examiner, they can appeal that decision um, to us if those rejections are still in place, if they haven't gotten an allowance. So we do a lot of work there. We also conduct AIA uh, proceedings based on challenges of issue patents by third parties. So this is no longer in prosecution. This is challenging patents that have issued. Uh, we also do um, interferences. Those are trickling down. I think we we definitely have less than 10 that are even still in the queue. Those went basically those went away with the American Events Act. Um, and and I did want to mention as part of our ex parte appeal work, this includes um, ex parte reexams and reissues. So what are ex parte appeals? I was just going to talk a little bit about that. I think I think I did just mention it. It's it's where the examiner has rejected claims twice or in a final office action. And um, what can happen? What it, Once it comes to the board, we can affirm. So basically, we affirm every rejection and every claim um, so, so far. Um, we can do an affirmance in part. We can do a reversal, which means none of those rejections are upheld. We can also do new grounds of rejection if we see them. Um, that doesn't happen as often, but it can happen. And if they do that, they have an opportunity to either file a request for a hearing or in fact, go back into prosecution. And right now today, our stats are about, probably about a third of the time, the examiner's actually reversed. Um, and about um, another 10%, it's affirmed in part. So it can be for people if they feel like they've gone through prosecution and they're just sort of hitting the wall, if you will, um, appealing to the PTAB can be successful. So what are AIA proceedings? These are the big things that you read about a lot more, sort of the hot, hot thing that's in the, in the IP press, if you will. Um, these proceedings are, they're intended to increase the integrity of the patent system. They're intended to act as a vehicle for third parties to challenge patents in a streamlined, efficient, and uh, and cost-effective proceedings. So it's supposed, it, it's intended to be a faster, cheaper alternative to district court litigation while also being an avenue to be a check on quality of patents. Um, and it, it, the big thing is it's supposed to be fast. Um, and I, we generally are quite fast. And I can talk about that in a little bit in a minute. But there are, right now, there are three types of AIA proceedings. One of them is what we call post-grant review or PGRs. These have to be filed within the nine month window of issuance in order to challenge, but the grounds at which you can raise are broad. It's basically everything other than best mode. Then you have inter-parties review, or what we call IPRs. These can challenge through the lifetime of the span of the, of the patents, but after that nine months. Um, so after that nine month window for a PGR, you can do it any time during the life of the patent. But these are limited in grounds of what you can challenge. Um, basically, it's um, anticipation or obviousness based on patents or printed publications. So it's a little bit narrow of what you can do. We also have derivations. Um, these aren't very large in number. Um, this is basically, you can do them within a year of the, the, the claims being published. And this is a proceeding where uh, a petition alleges that somebody derived an invention from another, from the other correct inventor. Um, and who can, who can file an AI proceeding? It's basically anybody except for the patent owner themselves. And it turns out a Supreme Court case said that the U.S. government can't do it either. Uh, we had some, for example, by the U.S. Postal Service or the Department of Agriculture. They, they can't do that. Um, and then also, um, I'm not going to go in too much of a deep dive, but there are timing restrictions. For example, for an IPR, it has to be filed within one year of being served a complaint. So there are certain things, activities that can happen that can bar somebody from filing one before us. Um, so this is, you probably can expect this, who's involved, a petitioner, this is the challenge, this is the person who files the petition, they have to pay a fee and they carry the legal burden throughout the proceeding. And then there's the patent owner and they have an opportunity to represent their interests throughout the entire proceeding. Um, and then of course, there's the panel of the three judges. So how does an AIA proceeding work? It has two phases. One is the institution phase. So uh, uh, somebody files a petition, the patent owner, if they wish, can file a patent owner preliminary response. Um, and this is where they might bring up um, reasons why we might deny institution, including um, discretionary denials, which is a whole nother conversation. We won't go too much of a deep dive in. Um, but at that point, there's a decision on the petition at, the, at what we call a decision on institution. Um, and either we institute 
or we don't. If we don't, that's the end of the proceeding. Um, and actually decisions on institution as a general matter cannot be appealed to the federal circuit. If we do institute, then at that point, the trial begins. The, the, the formal you know, IPR or PGR begins. Um, and at that point, the patent owner can file a, a, a response and a motion to amend if they wish. Petitioner, then there's briefing back and forth on that. We have an oral hearing generally about um, generally about three months before our due date. Um, one interesting thing to note, talk about the speed thing, is that um, we, by statute, have to resolve whether to institute within three months of um, the patent owner filing a response if they do or if they waive it. Um, and once we institute, we have to resolve with a final written decision within 12 months, um, although we can extend for good cause for another six months, but we generally don't do that very often. So what are the possible outcomes in a final written decision? So assuming we institute, and, and right now we, uh, we institute about two thirds of the time. Um, if you look at all decisions that actually address it, so discount settlements and things like that, if we actually have an inst decision on institution, we institute about two thirds of the time right now. That's fluctuated a little bit over time, but that's generally, generally held true. Um, but if we do institute and, we, and it doesn't settle or go away, um, and cases settle about, ranged over the years, about 20 to 30% of our cases settle either before or after institution. Um, but if they go the distance and they go to a final written decision, outcomes that can be, that you can see are either that all challenge claims are held in, are patentable, they're upheld. There can be mixed results, meaning some are found unpatentable, some are not, or all uh, claims are found unpatentable. And if we do issue a final written decision, um, you, the parties have um, options. They can seek rehearing. Uh, they can seek rehearing by, the, uh, by direct review. Um, since there's a Supreme Court case called Arthrex, and after that, the director by themselves can actually take a case on rehearing. So they can, so a, a party can request rehearing from the original panel, or they can request rehearing from the director review. Um, and either way, they can appeal to the federal circuit. Um, so those are their options. And just to give some background of our caseload for ex party, uh, so we dealt with, for example, in fiscal year. 2023, so the last fiscal year, uh, we handled nearly 6,000 cases. And 4,600 of them were ex parte appeals and about 1,300 of them were AIA decisions. Um, and our pendency for those for ex parte appeals has been about a year. And then for AIA, it's what you would expect. Uh, our pendency after a preliminary response for decision on institutions has been about three months and for um, final decision, it's been about a year. Um, another thing people ask about are hearings. Um, we do have hearings. We used to have uh, most of our AI hearings in person, but after COVID, um, right now we do a lot of hearings remotely. Uh, so last year, for example, fiscal year 23, we had uh, nearly 900 hearings um, and about 200 people requested uh, public audio feed. You can actually do that. You can hear uh, through audio feed um, hearings if you're interested in them, as long as they're not um, confidential, uh, which is pretty rare. Most of the times people can hear. And out of those, about 600 of them were remote. Um, and so you can see that a lot of them are through remote. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to mention a couple things because I know that some of this audience are students. I did want to mention that PTAB has a judicial law clerk program. Um, and you know the goals behind this is to have law clerks come and work for us so they can create a stronger patent bar. They can develop, um, you know, they can be part of developing, you know, future PTAB you know, practitioners for us and, and, you know, and infuse the private sector with, with law clerks, people who've actually been here on the inside. Um, and the way to apply is through USA Jobs. So if that is something you're interested in, you can um, apply through USA Jobs. Um, you can do alerts so that you know when they're there. Uh, but generally we hire every year now. Um, and right now we have eight law clerks and we have expanded a little bit every year. So that might, that might continue. Uh, the clerkships are about a year, they're paid. Um, you'll work closely with judges, with different panels of judges, and you know, hone your skills there. And then lastly, I wanted to mention, because this also comes up with law students, about um, there are USPTO student programs. Um, and if you do a search for Explore Our Student Programs, USPTO, if you do that Google search, you'll find our website, uh, the USPTO website on this. And it has programs, has information about paid internships, uh, trademark law in internship programs. 
programs, extern programs, and also our PTAB uh, law clerk program. So that's pretty exciting and check it out. Um, and if you're interested in things about PTAB generally, we have a ton on our website. Just do a search for USPTO PTAB and it'll bring you to PTAB's webpage. And there's just a colossal amount of information and we've tried to make it as user-friendly as possible. So that's a great way to learn about PTAB if you're interested. Wonderful. What a great way to end this introduction about the PTAB because jobs, jobs, jobs. What's yeah. there not to like about that? Uh, one quick follow up question about the clerkship program for folks that are not uh, as mobile, shall we say, do you have a remote option? So the clerks do come into the office. So generally they do come in for in person for this. And I, um, whether that would be something in the future, I don't know. But so far, they've all been in person. And, and this it is five days a week. Uh, yes. And it, 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 one of the things right now, the program is actually really outstanding because the the clerks rotate through by basically doing a detail in the front office. So they don't just work with PTAB judges. They also get to work with people in the front office and with the director. Um, they get to be involved, for example, you know, be in the room and maybe contribute thoughts on things um, for like director review and things like that. So they really do get a real inside glance into what it's like at PTAB and frankly, what's going on in the bigger picture at the office. So it's really, right now it is something you do come for, um, you know, come to DC to do, or the Alexandria area to do. Um, but, you know, I will say as an APJ, there are options to work telework. So I think the reason, part of the reason why we do it for clerks is because you might lose out a little bit on the experience if you don't actually come to on site to the USPTO campus. That that's at least at the moment that's what we're doing. Thank you. So let's talk about the APJ next, since we are on the, the issue of jobs. Uh what's what's the typical profile of the candidate you see uh transition into this APA position and what typically mo motivates that job transition? So um a lot of people who apply have, have been working in in some capacity somewhere for quite some time. Um, it's not going to be somebody who's a first year out. It's not even going to be a few years out. Um, I mean, for example, I was a third year partner when I applied. Um, so we're, unless there's something really spectacular, um, generally we're looking, you know, they're going to look for seven to 10 years experience at least at doing active patent law, whether it, but it doesn't have to be at a law firm. A lot of people do come from law firms, but it could be, um, you know, for DOJ, for the ITC, um, at the office itself in some capacity. Um, it does matter um, if you were, if you worked as an examiner before, you don't have to, but that is um, considered very favorable. We're looking for somebody who shows a real interest in PTAB work, has had opportunities to be exposed to it. If you've been involved in cases, uh, that really helps uh, what we're looking for. Um, if you've been involved in litigation, that's very helpful because there's an interplay between what we do. There's a lot of overlap and you know, procedures and things like that. Um, you know, the ex party appeal work is more prosecution. So if you can show you have experience there, that can be helpful. You know, it, it's changed over the years what we're really focused on, what we're looking for. Back when I applied in 2012, we had a huge backlog of ex party appeals. Um, and so they were really looking for people who were in addition and AIA was just getting started. So they were really looking for people to do ex party appeals. Um, you know, recently we have had a need for, for example, electrical people who are interested in AIA proceedings. So, you know, that, you know, we hire based on what we need and what's coming on the door. Um, and that, and we've seen that as the ex party um, appeal docket has gone down, but we're looking for anybody who shows, you know, initiative and interest in those areas and has the ability to be flexible to work on any of them, frankly, if they come in the door. So that's oh. what I would suggest. If somebody's interested, just make sure you're exposed to that. You see it. See if you can get on cases that are relevant to that, because um, that's that's really helpful. Okay. So electrical people, you heard it here first. You got the scoop. <laughs> so I will just warn you: things can change on a dime. <laughs> Two years from now, who knows? But um, but that is something that in the past has been a real need, just based on the types of cases that are being filed. Uh, that electrical background has been a huge need. Well, what motivated you to make that switch from practice into the PTAP? So I was doing, I, you know, when I was, I was at a firm, I was at, a, you know, at two different firms over 12 years. Um, I also clerked at the federal circuit. And so between all of those, I got a lot of exposure to things from the USPTO. Um, so I was working, I, I, 
I was at the time being a bit of a jack of all trades because I was thinking at the time that I might go in house somewhere. So I did have a prosecution docket. It was probably like 20 to 30 percent of my time. Um, I did a lot of client, client counseling. I did litigation. I did, you know, re-exams. I did interferences. I was trying to get exposed to everything because I didn't know what might be needed if I went in house. That's really what I was thinking at the time. But what ended up happening is in the process, I ended up getting um, experience in a lot of things at the board. Like I worked on some pretty gnarly interferences. There was uh, an interference relating to a vaccine. Um, that was two years of my life of spending a lot of, so got to know about like how the board works, how the briefing works. Um, I did ex party, you know, argued ex party appeals at the board, things like that. And one of the things I realized when I was doing it is that being an APJ would be the coolest job ever. <laughs> so I had thought that for years and actually I applied when I was, I think like a fifth or sixth year associate and I just wasn't experienced enough. So I, I don't even think I made it past the, the finish line for like the first cut. Um, but I was very, very interested. Um, and at the time, I thought, well, I wanted to be an interference, a, a trial judge on the interferences. Um, but then later on, AIA passed. And right around the time that AIA passed, there were openings again for APJs. And they, at, prior to that, they didn't come up very often at all. Uh, they were very rare. And they were opening it up for all technologies. They needed everybody. Uh, so I literally applied immediately. <laughs> Um, and got into the queue. And so I, that, and it was something, and again, I was excited to be an APJ, no matter what the jurisdiction was. I was just, I just thought it was a really neat job. I saw how smart they were. I saw the types of work that they did. Um, and it just, to me, that, that seemed super cool. So I, um, so I applied and I was one of the first that were hired as part of sort of the hiring bump. Uh, when I came into the board, I was literally APJ 100. I was the 100th APJ at the time. In the few years prior to that, I think it was 80. So they had expanded a little bit. Um, but over the next years, as you saw, especially over the next like three or four years after that, there was massive hiring. Uh, we went up at one point to 270. Um, and now we are about down to 230, sort of acclimating out with uh, retirements and just, just normal attrition. Um, but you know, I if, if one of the things I would tell people is if you're interested in this, our postings for APJs are also on USA Jobs. Um, there are also another place of interest, frankly, is to work at the solicitor's office. That's a really cool job too, um, because you can, even as a third or fourth, fourth year associate level, you can go in there, you can get hired and you can be arguing cases at the federal circuit, which I can tell you, even as a partner, you might not ever do. So, um, and I would say that about DOJ and in, 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 in their cool jobs at the ITC, there are places to get the experience that are really, you know, button you up. Um, and, you know, you can go to a law firm for a while, then go to the government for a while. And then when you get ready, when you're a little bit more advanced and you have the resume to support it, then you can apply to be an APJ um, and, and look really great. That's cool. Now, before we switch gears from the PTAP, I want to ask you a omnibus question and can answer however you like. What are the main challenges and opportunities facing the PTAP today? So, um, I think one of the challenges that's going on at the board today is that, you know, we have a lot of jurisdictions that we handle and we have a large number of judges doing it. Um, and often the landscape of what is applicable law and policy uh, at the USPTO that applies to us, it can be at the federal circuit, it can be at the Supreme Court and just, you know, different directors come in, you know, different things. And, and, and as we have experience with things, things change over time. Um, and so we, we do have a changing landscape. Um, and notwithstanding the fact that AIA is nearly you know, 12 years old, it's still relatively new. Um, and we get new issues and new positions argued and briefs. It, it comes up all the time, even still. So that's a challenge for us. You know, we have to make sure that we are, you know, we're adapting and that we continue to do so to make sure uh, as issues come up, because we want to be the, the neutral adjugatory body that is doing the best that we can on behalf of stakeholders and the people that we that we work on behalf, um, you know, the patent system at large. And so we are constantly doing that. And what you've seen over the last five to eight years in particular is we've been modifying rules and procedures and precedent and practice guides and, and director guidance to make sure that we're doing that best job we can for the patent system. 
I mean, in AIA in particular, you know, we, we, we started doing that. That ended up being more popular than expected. And then in real practice, we saw, okay, there were these things squeezing out over here. And these were, these were these things that we hadn't, that maybe weren't necessarily contemplated or covered by the statute. So you saw us, and, that, and, and a lot of that, for example, happened in the discretionary denial or discretionary denial area in, in, in institution of AIA proceedings. So you see a lot of work done there. Um, so we're, you know, that's that's a really hot area. Uh, that's one that is still going on. You saw an ANPRM. Uh, this is an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking to get comments from people. You see that. Um, I think another challenge that we have is that, you know, AIA in particular e ended up being a much bigger deal than everybody expected. Uh, they made projections when when um, the rule package went out because we were required by the statute to put rules out right away. And I think we, you know, it. Uh, it IPRs, for example, were intended to replace inter, uh, inter parties re-exams. And we thought that the load that we would see would be about the same, and it ended up being um, three times that. Uh, so it was, it, it exploded a little bit over the years. Um, and it also ended up having a pretty significant impact on patent litigation generally, um, precisely because it worked exactly as it intended. It ended up being a faster, cheaper alternative to district court litigation. And so people started taking advantage of this and it started having an impact on what was happening there. Um, you know, and another challenge that we've had is that when you're in the spotlight and it becomes, and something is a big deal, one weirdness that can pop out is all of a sudden people start becoming hypercritical. So we have seen some harsh critics of the AIA some of you, a very limited few, who propagated some misinformation about what the PTAB actually is, what it's doing, and things like that. So one of the things we've been working on is to make sure that we get the information out there about who we are, what we do, what's actually happening in our cases, and how we fit in the bigger system at large, um, so that you know people are properly informed. People make you know the best decisions they can when they have the right information in front of them, and so we want to make sure that they we. That we have that we make sure that we have that information out there. So that's why you see a bunch of stuff on our websites. You'll see data studies. You'll see different studies, sort of looking at what we've done and, and what has been the outcome in cases. You know, keeping you know keeping track of us and, and making sure that when we've done X, Y, and Z, that we knew what the outcome was of X, Y, and Z, um, so that we we could we could do that. So those are some of our challenges. Um, I will say in terms of opportunities. I will being an administrative patent judge and doing cases at the PTAB at all. It, it's just really fun and rewarding and impactful work. Um, I, I think we're at the cutting edge and people are watching us, which has its yin and yang, as I just discussed. But, you know, it's never boring, um, whether you're handling cases or as I am now, like working on policies and procedures generally. There's always something interesting going on. People are really passionate about it. And that's exciting to be a part of that. Um, and I will just say, you know, working for the federal government generally, whether it's at PTAB or the solicitor's office or DOJ or ITC anywhere, it really is an, it's an incredible opportunity. And often it gives you opportunities to do things much earlier than you would get at a firm. And, and it's government service. I mean, it's, you know, you don't get as paid as well as you do in private practice, but it is government service. It's giving back to the community, giving back to the system. Um, and there's, there's some integrity and in, 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 in something very fulfilling about doing that. Thank you. And talking about being seen and getting the word out, uh, you do a fantastic job at that. I've seen you at conferences. Uh, this uh, platform provides that opportunity. And so I was very pleased that Deputy Director Brent uh, did something similar. And I think it's it's so important and so helpful for folks to just be able to hear directly from uh, the people that work in the system, the people that make the system run smoothly. So. Uh, even though we're only at half time, I want to thank you for your service and thank you for doing that. Sure, no, thank you. <laughs> and this is profiles and leadership. So I want I want to now focus the spotlight on you and your career journey, so people can understand how you got to this point. Uh, so take us back to college, and so you decide that you want to do biochemistry. Uh, this is a career path. But did you want to become a lawyer after this or did you think about something else after college? You know, it's really funny. So when I was in college, um, I was going, I planning to go to grad school. I was going to be a scientist. I was going to go work in academia or I was going to go uh, work for a company. And I thought about law school, but it was just kind of this little thing in the back of my head. I wasn't really taking seriously. Like I didn't look into taking the LSATs or anything like that. I just, you know, I, I, I went to grad school. I was all in. 
Um, and then as I was in, in grad school for me, it took six years. That's how long my, my PhD program took. And it was toward the end of that, that I started getting serious about patent law. And I hadn't really thought that much about it before, but I, I got serious about it. And I remember what I did was I actually cold called some patent attorneys in DC. And I said, hey, I'm interested in this. Is this a viable career option? Do you like what you do? Um, and it was, it was funny because everybody said, yes, this is a viable career option, especially for somebody with a background like yours. Absolutely. And I remember I talked to one guy who apparently had just won a litigation. He's like, I can tell you when you win your cases, it's the funnest job ever, <laughs> <laughs> which of course is true. Um, but I, 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 you know, I did a little bit of diligence and found out that it was, it was viable. And I was interested in doing that because at the time I saw that you know, funding was getting a little bit tighter. The jobs were very competitive. Getting the money to do it was very competitive. So I was trying to think outside the box. Like, what could I do that's giving back and taking advantage of my background that's a little bit different? Um, I don't know that I would have thought about going to law school after getting a PhD, for example, in high school or college, because that would have seemed way too daunting. I mean, it, it, it kind of it's kind of hilarious to me that I actually did do that because that just seems kind of crazy to have that number of degrees. But if you, it's kind of like running a marathon. If you just keep going and you keep going and you keep going, it's like all of a sudden, well, okay, I actually did do the 26 miles or whatever it is. Uh, and that's what I tell people just, you know, just not quitting sometimes is, is huge, but I didn't really see myself doing that, but then I ended up doing it. And um, I went to law school and when I was in law school, I will say when I was in law school itself, especially my first year, I explored other options other than being a patent attorney, taking advantage of my background. So I looked into like, for, ex for instance, um, forensic criminal law. Uh, my criminal law professor actually got me a visit at Quantico. So I went there to go visit what it would be like to become an FBI agent and maybe do something along the lines of what I was doing. That was really neat. Um, I looked up into FDA work and things like that. I was looking into all the different options of what I could do, but the thing that really struck a chord for me was patent law. And I ended up being a summer associate at law firms, both of the summers. And frankly, that's what really cinched it for me. Law school itself, I didn't necessarily get the insight I needed into knowing whether this was going to be my passion, but going and working as a, a summer associate, it really, I was like, this is what I like to do. I really enjoyed it. Um, and then of course I, you know, graduated. I went to go work for a law firm. I worked for Finnegan Henderson for two years. Um, that was a great place to go to, to, in terms of getting trained and figuring out what to do and getting exposure to everything. That was really, really great. And then I um, went and I clerked at the federal circuit. I ended up clerking for a year and a half for Judge Rader. That was wonderful. Um, if anyone can have an opportunity to clerk, I highly recommend it. I feel like that's where I really learned how to write. Um, I, all you do as a clerk is you, is you read briefs and you write bench memos. And sometimes you have a chance to draft you know, preliminary opinions for the judge. That was incredible. Um, and then I went to Foley and Lardner. And again, this was a great Foley and Lardner was a general practice law firm. Um, and I liked that too, because I had exposure. I think I mentioned to you, I was interested in um, potentially going in house. So I liked the fact they had a corporate practice. They had an FDA practice. They had, you know, all sorts of other things. So while I was there, I was exposed to all of those things. Um, and like I said, I was thinking, well, I'll either stay here, become a partner and do that, you know, however long, or maybe go in house somewhere. I was interested in that too. But the interesting thing is that in the process of doing that without even necessarily trying at the time, I was laying the groundwork for also having a great background for becoming an APJ. Um, and that is something I started thinking about seriously only after I started working on some interferences when I was in private practice. Um, and, and especially that one interference I mentioned to you where um, we worked on a, a vaccine thing. That was because that was really intense. Um, that was a four party interference. And it was just like every brief that could have been filed. There were hundreds of depositions like it was the whole nine yards. And um, and I really love that. And I saw the judges in action. I was like, wow. So that's when I got serious about watching. Um, and I will tell you that I, you know, so I started paying attention about when there were postings and they didn't come along very long, very long. And then I, I found out that there was a posting. It was actually right before AI passed in September of 2012. Um, and I was advised if you're interested, jump, do it right now, <clears throat> which I did. Um, and, and, and I guess the rest is history. So, you know, part of what I would say is 
where I ended up being is not where I thought I would be, um, but where I ended up being is 10 times better than where I thought I would be. So, you know, I think it's important to be flexible and to get as much experience as you can. So when these sort of out of the box experiences come up, you're ready for them. Um, you know, to think about how you can to not just you know, not just do one single, you know, not just do patent litigation or whatever. I mean, unless you're passionate about being a litigator, then you do what you do. Um, but there is some advantage, I think, to getting exposure to other things so that if something comes along, you're like, oh, yeah, I have this on my resume. I can show you why I can do this. I can expand upon this at the next next phase of whatever I'm doing. You know, th this is a terrific segue to ask you about how you make decisions, because uh, on hindsight, it seems like everything worked out. But at each of those points, it sounds like you had no idea how it would turn out. And you said it just so happens it turned out 10 times better. Uh, what is your thought process in saying, okay, th these are the things that I'm going to say yes to. And when I say yes to something, I'm necessarily going to say no to something else. And that's okay. Yeah, no, that's tough. I mean, that's especially tough if you're, I mean, because one of the things I was going to say based on the questions you gave me is, you know, how do you present yourself? You know, be a go-getter. Um, go after the things, think outside the box, ask for projects. Do do When somebody asks you to do something that sounds a little bit off the beaten path, maybe you should really consider it. Um, but I do think it's important for, for mental health and your own sanity to figure out what you're going to say no to, too. Um, so, I, you know, you can think about, well, is this something, um, and you always want to look like somebody who's a go-getter and a, a person who says yes, unless you really can't. Like, you don't want to overdo it. But, you know, you want to look like somebody who is like, whatever you need, I'm your, I'm your person. Um, but at the same time, if you do have multiple options, I would pick the thing that stretches you a little bit. Um, do the thing that's going to give you, especially early on, like 10 years or less of experience. I mean, you want to you want to get exposure to things because the higher up you go on the ladder, regardless of where you are, you start becoming more and more focused about what you're doing. I mean, you'll see, for example, a lot of patent litigators, they're they're doing well, they're bringing in business, they're running litigations, but they don't do anything else because it's all consuming. So when, earlier in your career, you have a little bit more flexibility to try different things to figure out what you're passionate about, because that's what you want. Um, I, I think one of the things you asked me is, you know, what's the difference between a law firm and, and being an APJ? And one of the things I was thinking about is both require hard work, dedication, and frankly, passion for the job to keep it up. Um, if you're going to really stay in it, you have to you have to be passionate about it and really want to do it, because if you don't, sooner or later, you're going to burn out and, you know, you're, you're going to not want to do that anymore. Um, but at the same time, regardless of whether you like something and you're passionate about it, you know, stay open to other things. There can be really outside of the box thinking things that are not necessarily at a law firm, things are that aren't even necessarily at the USPTO. Um, you know, you can go work on the Hill, you can go work. I mean, there's there's all sorts of things that you can do. And sort of if you're, you know, make sure that you're getting the experience that leads to those types of opportunities if you're open to them. And it's so easy. It's so easy, especially when you're working really hard to sort of get pigeonholed and get stuck and not move outside of that box. So you have to consciously think about it you know, over periods of time, like, where am I? What am I doing? Am I happy with what I'm doing? Do I want to do something else too? Um, and I have found um, the vast majority of people I've worked with, with no matter where it has been, has there, if, if you like set up a meeting or lunch with somebody and you tell him, hey, I'm thinking about this, people will step up and they will find opportunities for you and they will figure out, they'll talk to people for you. I, I'm always amazed. You know, the whole patent bar is just, it's actually a great group of people. Um, you know, just so many people are so helpful and they want to bring everybody up and they want to train the next people who are coming. So people will be open to helping you, you know, figure out what else you might want to do and how you can sort of lay the groundwork for where you're going next and including in places that you won't even have thought of. Thanks. And, you know, that's both an encouraging and such an important note for students to know the community that they are signing up to be part of is a very inclusive, very welcoming community. And I found that certainly to be true for myself too. Uh, so now you're in the leadership of the PTAP. What does that mean in terms of your job day to day? So, so I've had two, well, I've had, so I've been on the executive leadership side of, of the PTAP. Um, and, and basically that's senior executive service or what we call SES. Um, and that's when you start managing sort of the bigger picture. So uh, we do handle cases sometimes, but a lot more of my time is spent on what's the bigger picture about what the board should be doing, how to manage the board. 
Um, so as, as deputy chief judge, um, you know, I, I work with the chief judge. I act, the deputy acts as their second. So if the chief judge is out, um, but I also work with a whole team of, of, of executive folks. It's our board executive. It's our director of view executive. We have five vice chiefs. Um, and we also have a few senior lead judges that help us. And, and this, this group basically manages the board, which is about, like I said, 230 judges and about 115 staff members. And, and as part of that, we engage in executive management, strategic planning, financial functions. Uh, so this includes, you know, identifying and develop and implementing policy. Uh, it can be through um, things like, you know, rulemaking and precedential decisions and guides like our trial practice guide, standing operating procedures, which are needed for internal operation, director guidance, pilot programs, things like that. Um, so that, those are the kind of things that I work on a lot today. And this work is really important because it helps the the USPTO and the board ensure that we're, you know, we're doing predictable, reliable, you know, in, in maintaining consistency across basically thousands of decisions that, you know, over 200 judges issue every year. Um, it's not a small feat to make sure that that we do that. Um, we also manage, you know, administrative teams such as, you know, how are, you know, the, the team that handles how we panel cases and how we run hearings. And then, of course, we do stakeholder outreach, the kind of things that we're doing right now with, you know, the, the legal community, with bar groups, um, just to educate the public, uh, both in and out of the office, frankly, and hear uh, feedback from stakeholders. Um, so it, that's what I do as the as the deputy chief. As in, so what I've been doing since um, since May of 2022 is acting as I'm on detail as senior legal advisor to the director to Ka to Kathy Vidal, our director, and um, you know that's. That's even higher level still, but a lot of it is overlap. So bigger picture, you know, I, I am part of a lot of people who advise the director on patent related, you know, legal policies. Do we need changes? And if so, where are things working well? Are they not working so well? Are things are there things within our power at the office, you know, within the statutory confines that we have to change things? So they can policies can come all the different ways that I mentioned to you, there's also, um, I mentioned director review. So how does that work? What happens in specific cases? Um, I, I work on that as part of the advisory committee for the director. And then also litigation um, before the federal circuit and the Supreme Court will have, you know, that's obviously handled by the solicitor's office, but I will, you know, read briefs and things like that and provide some feedback on cases, especially as it relates to PTAB. Um, on cases that are going on. Um, those cases can be handled by the solicitor's office or the Department of Justice um, attorneys there. And, you know, the Department of Justice sometimes need tutorials on, well, what is actually going on in the weeds at PTAB? And so we're, we're a part of that. Um, so it, it, it is interesting. Um, you know, when I came, I did all cases all the time for a long time and then just sort of slowly evolved <laughs> to, the to, the, to the roles that I have now. Um, it's wonderful to be a judge ju just doing cases, honestly, that's a really, really fantastic job in its own right. Uh, but it's also fun to do things at this sort of higher executive level too, because you get to make decisions, bigger picture about how the board should work um, and, and making sure that the public knows about it. So that's that's what I do now. Um, and it's, it's, it's terrific. Um, I can recommend it to anyone, but it's also, Again, it's it can be a lot of work and it, and it can, you know, you can deal with feedback from people that and you get somebody says this and somebody says this and they're not consistent with each other and sort of trying to figure out how, how to get all that together. Um, but it's if it's something you're really passionate about, it, it can be right, really exciting to have a seat at the table when all these things are are going on. Great thoughts then. Very interesting. A few questions. So in, in your advisor role, are you mostly uh, reactive? Something comes in. Director says, what do you think about this? Or are you proactively saying, you know, director, you need to think about this and here's the advice that I have? So we definitely do both. Both happens at the same time. Um, we, for example, you know, we at PTAB, we look at our decisions after we they issue and we determine, hey, is there a conflict? Are, are there board conflict, panel conflicts? 
Um, are there issues that we're seeing in cases that people, things that are getting raised, either because stakeholders mentioned to us or we see them in cases, hey, there's this hole in the law or there's this other thing going on and somebody's doing something a little bit weird and I, that's not what we intended. Um, so we think about that and keep an eye on that all the time. And we're making recommendations to the director all the time, if nothing else, to make her aware of what it is. Um, obviously, um, Director Vidal does that on her own as well. She has lots of thoughts and she'll say, hey, what about this? And we'll you know, brief her on what's going on in this particular area. And she'll say, hey, can we change this? Can we do this better? How can we do this better? I mean, that's a question we think about all the time you know, in terms of what we present to her and what she presents to us. We're basically, that's what we're doing all the time. So we are both proactive and reactive to her, her thoughts or frankly, when we hear something from the stakeholders, we take all the stuff that we hear very, very seriously all the time. It may not necessarily appear that way, but internally we are taking everything seriously and talking about it in depth. And you do this through weekly cabinet meetings? You do? So we we have meetings, we have meetings all the time with Kathy. Um, sorry, with the director of it all. Um, we have, PTAB has weekly meetings with her. I have weekly meeting with her with other advisors. There are other advisors um, who, I, I focus mostly on PTAB, but we have advisors for patents and trademarks and, uh, you know, outreach and other, all sorts of initiative that, that, that director Vidal is interested in. And, um, you know, we get together, um, we have meetings about director review cases and things like that. So we have, in, you know, we have meetings directly with the director all the time on all the different things um, to make sure that we're current. I think we need to do that to make sure that we're current on everything that's going on all the time, because there's a lot going on, a lot moving at any given time. Now, one of the students uh, had this question for you, because they know about your pharmacology background. And a lot of the, these people with tech backgrounds, do you think, oh, I know something about, you know, engineering, mechanical engineering, but I know nothing about pharmacology uh, in your work? Uh, does it make you more focused on a particular type of technology? And if not, how do you deal with other patents covering other types of areas? So with my background, um, when I handle cases, I generally am paneled on, I, I'm somebody that is selected for paneling purposes to handle those cases. But, you know, when you have the background, especially if you've been working for a while, like, for example, sometimes I would handle medical devices, which end up being pretty mechanical in nature. And that's something I have experienced through um, both in private practice and at the board. Um, I can handle chemical cases. So maybe something about it's like, you know, patent on how tires are made. Um, you know, it, it's so my technical background is actually broader than what my undergraduate degree or PhD is in. Um, and when you practice um, just in private practice or regular practice, you're going to get exposed to a ton of things. <clears throat> you'll do that as patent prosecution. You'll do that in litigation. You'll do that all sorts of areas. So <clears throat> you're not pigeonholed into doing exactly what you, I mean, the odds of you getting cases that are exactly in your sweet spot of what you studied in school, that's great. And those will come along, but you're, I, I think just being trained, frankly, that way, to think that way and to know how to read scientific papers and how to get up to speed on technology is a real asset. So, you know, as, a, as an APJ, people do have areas where they feel more comfortable versus others. Like I probably wouldn't be comfortable doing a hardcore electrical case myself. So I'm probably not the, if I were to be paneled on such a case, I would be paneled with other people who are. So for example, if that were to happen, I, I know that for paneling purposes, we try when we can to have three judges who have, you know, have a good background to handle the case, whether it's from their education or just from their work experience. Um, but in sometimes you get what you get and you don't get it's upset because that's what comes in the door. But even in that case, we try to have, you know, a, a one or two judges that have some good technical background. And then we have other people at the office who have technical background who can help us there too. So. Um, I don't think you need to worry that you have a particular technical background that you're going to be pigeonholed, but I also think you have opportunities to work on things where you do take advantage of that technical background. And I wouldn't underestimate the fact that if you have the wherewithal to get a technical background in anything, you probably have the ability to figure out how to do it elsewhere. Um, I will say that today, um, in the role that I carry today, I do more high level policy that isn't necessarily focused on a particular technology. Uh, one exception is that there's an effort at the office um, that's actually being um, overseen by Linda Horner um, at PTAB, which is a, um, there was an executive order that asked the office to collaborate with the FDA in terms of what either of the agency can do to, you know, sort of address things that are going on in the pharma patent space. 
And um, that collaboration is ongoing. You'll see, uh, actually, if you're interested in that sort of thing, it's on our website. So we've had meetings with them. We've had public meetings and things like that. So that kind of thing is sort of pharma focused, um, but it's sort of a higher level initiative for the office. So there's opportunities for things like that. But a lot of what I do now for PTAB outside of things like that aren't necessarily technology focused. They're things like, you know, how do our procedures working? How, how should we do things as a matter of policy in a bigger picture impacting all of our cases? Um, so it depends, you know, it depends on what you're interested in, the kind of things that you get involved in. But I think that um, there are opportunities either way. Great. Uh, nearly, nearly nearing the hour. So I just have a couple more questions uh, to round off our time together. Uh, the first, Again, since this is a leadership-focused uh, podcast, I would just want to invite you to think about uh, one thing you've learned about leadership over the years. Well, um, the first one is to be flexible. Um, when leadership roles come, sometimes they don't look exactly like you thought they would. Um, so when when those opportunities present themselves, you know, take on things that go outside the basics of what your job has been so far. Um, this is sort of what I was saying before. You want to look like a go-getter, somebody people can count on, um, look, including things that aren't terribly exciting. Like sometimes you'll be asked to take a leadership on something that, you know, just really isn't, it needs to be done. You only get credit if it goes wrong, right? Um, and so, but if you look like somebody who can handle those things, that's that's really advantageous for, you know, if you're interested in leadership positions. I mean, one of the things that's sort of interesting about the SES position is that when you're hired for that, you're thought to be the kind of leader that you you can be placed anywhere. Um, generally speaking, you get placed where you have a good background to do it. But the idea behind SES is that you're a leader and you know how to be a leader, even if you don't, even if all your job is, is to lead other people who know what they're doing. Um, so that's something that you transition to as you become a leader, is you realize the experts in the room aren't even necessarily you. So you, part of you is making sure that those people have what they need to give you, you know, the, to give the project the, the things that you need, that you organize, that you get on timelines, that you you do what needs to be done, and you make sure that you're not sort of spinning your wheels off elsewhere. So that's so that's sort of an interesting aspect of leadership is that you may no longer be the person who actually really knows the weeds. Um, and, and it's interesting because in order to become a leader, you often are somebody who's really good at knowing the weeds, right? And so you have to transition to things like delegating and stuff like that to other people who are doing that. So that, that's sort of an interesting transition and can be challenging for people to do that. Um, it's like, I have to delegate, I can't do this project myself. I have to delegate to somebody else, oversee it, and then just review everything that's going on and then present it from the team. Um, that's that. That can be interesting and challenging, but very, very rewarding. Um, but the main thing I would say is, you know, look out and be ready for, you know, opportunities that surprise you. Um, sometimes they can really be outside the box and a way for you to really grow and get leadership positions in, in ways that you haven't thought of. Thanks. Well, final question. Life outside of work, what does that look like for you? I'm sorry, say that one more time. Life outside of work. Oh, life outside of work? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, it's, you obviously want to have one life balance is really critical, especially when you when you have, you know, high pressure things going on. Um, you know, I have my family, um, that's really important. Uh, we do travel when we can, we like to go to the beach. I mean, obviously, that's really important. I, um, I try to exercise when I can, I keep saying I'm going to take up meditation, because I think that would be great, but I haven't actually pulled that off yet. Um, but, you know, that's a lot of, of you know, trying to find time for myself, doing walks in nature, hiking when I can, things like that. Those, those are the kind of things that I enjoy doing outside of work when I can. And spending time with family and friends. I mean, that, that, that recharges my batteries doing that. Thanks. What, what a comprehensive uh, overview of the work that you do. Uh, what inspiring thoughts. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Propels and Leadership. And again, thank you for your service and all that you do for the nation. Great, thank you so much.